본격적인 대화로 이제 그 들어가기 전에 뭐 간단히만 이제 그 감독님에 대해서 이제 그 말씀을 드리면은 뭐 이번에 이제 그 상영작에서 또 많이 그런 특징들을 보셨겠지만은 그러니까 가장 특징적인 어떤 요소가 어떻게 보면 이미지와 마음 그 문학과 이제 뭐 철학 등을 포함한 어떤 인수에 대한 언어 사이의 어떤 상호작용을 이제 가장 특징으로 하면서 어떻게 그런 이제 텍스트가 마음 말하자면 그런 영화 속에서 언어이자 이미지로 함께 작용하는지 그리고 이제 그 탐구를 이제 하고 때론 그둘 사이의 어떤 텍스트와 이미지 사이의 관계 어떤 경계를 기묘하게 이제 그 뒤섞으면서 이제 그 독특한 영화 세계를 추구하셨습니다. 그래서 이뭐 예, 테크닉적으로도 뭐 실험 영화 쪽에서 어떤 잘 발달된 그런 이제 카메라 없는 카메라리스라고 하는 이제 용어를 쓰게 되는데 카메라리스 테크닉들을 나뭐 이제 아주 극단적인 크로즈업 시네마토그래피나 또 옵티컬 프린팅 기반의 그런 테크닉들을 이제 잘 적용시켜 오셨고 또 이번에 그그 눈부신 그림자들에서는 디지털로 또 이제 작업을 하심으로 해서 어떤 이제 그 매체의 이제 그 어떤 경계를 또 확장을 또 하고 계십니다. 그래서 사실 이제 그 여러 사실 많은 작품들이 있는데 그러니까 뭐 이따 이제 대화할 때도 나오겠지만 사실 이제 그 감독님의 어떤 그 초기에 어떤 중요한 이제 작품으로 이제 취급이 되는 것이 어떤 연작인데. 그게 이제 그 한국으로 번역한 뭐 구분선의 은밀한 역사, 구부로 이루어진 진실한 설명 뭐 이렇게 될 것입니다. Secret History of the Dividing Line, A True Account of Nine Parts 라는 이제 그 그런 연작을 이제 그 만드셨고 이 작품이 이제 그저 아트포럼 매거진에서 그런 표현 한적 있어요. 그러니까 최근 영화에서 이제 그 가장 어떻게 보면 좀 박직하고 아주 야망 있는 그런 이제 그 과제를 수행한. 그런 작품이다. 뭐 원어로 말씀드 one of the most erudite and ambitious undertakings in recent cinema라고 이제 그 아트 포럼에서 이제 그 이제 평을 한바 있고요. 그리고 또 그런 어떤 이제 평가 이외에도 사실 21세기 어떻게 보면 이제 그그 부감 그 부감에 있고 노르스아메리카 이제 그이 어떤 실험 영화 비디오에서 가장 중요한 이제 그 어떤 감독으로 자리 잡으셨고 그래서 이뭐 하바드 빌 마카이브나 그 워싱턴 D.C.의 내셔널 갤러리 오브 아트라든지 뭐 워낙 여러 이제 그 곳에서 이제 그 감독님의 작품 세계를 조명하는 다양한 스크린들이 이제 그 있었습니다. 그래서 한국에는 이제 사실 그 이번에 스크린에는 그 최근작들과 이제 그 어떻게 보면 가장 그 지금 후기에 중요한 대작인 그 The e x p r e r i m e n t s h a d o w 즉 눈부신 그림자들 이렇게 상영이 되는데요. 뭐그 감독님의 그런 이제 그 영화 세계와 어떤 이제 그 이력들을 이제 조감하면서 그 상영작들을 이제 살펴보는 뭐좀 그런 질문들을 좀 준비를 했는데 이제 좀 하나하나씩 이제 좀그좀 그 풀어가면서 뭐 저희 이제 그 감독님의 영화 세계를 이제 좀더 탐사를 하기로 하고 그리고 뭐한한 한 60분 정도 지금 잡고 있는데. 이제 그 여러분들과 이제 그 궁금하신 점들에 대해서 이제 그 대화를 할수 있는 뭐 이번 상영된 작품들뿐만 아니라 어떤 다른 이제 그 어떤 실험 영화 어떤 제작이라든지 어떤 영화의 뭐 어떤 미학 역사 등 다양한 어떤 질문들을 이제 그 여러분들과 이렇게 함께 대화를 할수 있는 그런 시간으로 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 예, 그래서 그 처음에 이제 뭐그 질문 아무래도 이제 그 감독님이 이제 그 실험 영화에 어떻게 이제 매혹이 들고 또 그런 실험 영화를 실천하게 되는가라는 어떤 이제 그이좀 과정에 대한 이제 뭐 어떤 일반적인 질문이 되겠습니다. 그래서 뭐그 전에 이제 그 감독님과 관련된 인터뷰들을 살펴보면은 뭐 그러니까 이 우리나라에도 사실 이제 실험 영화나 비디오 쪽에 이제 그이잘 좀 알려진 학교가 이제 시카고 아트 인스티튜션 인스티튜트 시카고 예술학교인데 거기서 이제 수학하셨고 거기서의 또 경험이 이제 또큰 영향을 미쳤다고 이제 말씀하시고 또 여러 실험 영화 감독들의 어떤 입문 과정 그 매혹된 과정들을 언급하십니다. 뭐 스탠브라 카주라든지 홀리스 프램튼이라든지 그런 이제 그 어, 이 어떤 어떻게 이제 실험 영화의 세계에 이제 그 빠져들게 되었고 무엇이 영향을 미쳤는가에 대해서 좀 말씀을 들으면서 이야기를 시작하겠습니다. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, first, I want to say how happy I am to be here. This is my first time in Asia, and uh, I feel very honored to be able to present so many of my works here at the museum. And so I would like to thank everyone involved in making this possible. Uh, so thank you. At some level, this is all a mistake. I started out to, in 1980 when I was nine years old to be a computer programmer because my uncle had given me a computer. He worked for the phone company for Bell Labs and he thought it would be fun for me. So I, write, I started to write very simple video games and that was the first way I made images move. But I also got something at that point was called a modem where you could call other computers on the phone. And I found the phone number for the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab computer, and I broke into it. But I got caught, and so my parents took away my computer. And I had to go out onto the street uh, where all of my friends were breakdancing. And so I learned to breakdance and became a professional breakdancer. I then started to do theater, and then I got interested in what was called experimental theater, and I moved to the city of Chicago to act in experimental theater. But one day, with my friends, we went to an exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago of video art. And there was a black and white video uh, on the wall on, a, on an old cathode ray tube, and it was just an image of a plant. And the videotape was silent. And I stood there looking at it for three minutes, wondering, why is this in a museum? Suddenly, after a minute, a voice started screaming from the speaker. A, 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 A. B, 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 B. C, 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 C. And I thought, what on earth is this? And then I looked at the title of the piece. The video was called Teaching a Plant the Alphabet. And I thought, this is very interesting, and I should learn more about this. So I, I started to read about the history of video art first, and then uh, avant-garde and experimental cinema in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and in Asia. And I decided I would go back to Chicago to go to graduate school in their film, and film department. I was very interested in the work of both Stan Brakhage and Hollis Frampton when I read about them, because one filmmaker, Stan Brakhage, had an idea that sight was most pure in the absence of language, that language actually made it harder to see. And he wrote very famously, imagine how many colors there are in a blade of grass for the baby who does not know the word green. They could see lots and lots of colors. Hollis Frampton, however, believed that without language enabling us to name something, book, bottle, microphone, that the world was an undifferentiated mass of stimuli that we would not be able to perceive without language. Language made perception possible in Hollis Frampton's mind. For me, I thought it was in between, that it didn't have to be one or the other, sometimes one, sometimes the other, oftentimes both. At the end of my first year of school, my professor, the filmmaker Daniel Eisenberg, suggested that I should show this film to Stan Brakhage, who was living in Colorado at the time. And I made a phone call, and Brakhage very graciously agreed to look at my film. He liked my film, uh, and then he programmed it in a show of new works by young artists uh, in 1996 at Anthology Film Archives. And that is how my career began. Anthology Film Archives in New York City is a place that was founded in 1970. It's a very famous venue for the exhibition of American avant-garde cinema and European art house cinema from uh, Eisenstein and uh, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Carl Theodore Dreyer, through people like Maya Darren, Kenneth Anger, Stan Brakhage, Harry Smith, etc. You don't have to say all those names, but many filmmakers associated all ha showed their work at Anthology. Uh, so it was a great honor for me to have my work shown by Stan Brakhage and also to have it shown at Anthology Film Archives, a, a major venue in the United States.
Uh, so I, I felt that I had been accepted by this community of, of a certain kind of filmmakers that has a 100 year history and I decided I wanted to keep making work in this way. I was very attracted to the way in which Brackage attended to light and rhythm and the way Hollis Frampton used language to create meaning. Because I grew up in North Carolina in a southern state in the United States in the 1970s and I write with my left hand, I was, at that time, we were still called devil's children. Anyone who wrote with a left hand, that was not allowed. That was, you were thought to be a devil. So I was never taught how to write. They gave me crayons and put me in the corner. And so still today, I have trouble reading my own writing. And I think that has played into my interest in the line between the legible and the illegible. The moment when something can be identified as language and writing or when it moves over into drawing. Very much like calligraphy uh, in many cultures can also be thought of as both writing and drawing. So my first movies were about that relationship of the illegible to the illegible. At the same time, I also became very interested in the surface of 16 millimeter film itself. I had made computer images, digital images, but 16 millimeter film is different. I learned how to process it. Sometimes in processing, it gets marks on it. It gets dirty. It has a passage through the world in which experience is inscribed on the surface of the film. And those traces may be legible in the same way that as our bodies pass through the world, we get marks, we get scars. Just before I came to Seoul, my two-year-old daughter scratched, scratched my arm. I can interpret this scratch. It is legible. The film surface can sometimes be the same way. Film has a body. It has a skin, like we have a skin. And stories can be evoked by this skin. The meaning of the trace is very important in my cinema. I think that was a very long answer to your question. I'll try to be shorter on the next one. I don't think so. Yeah, 그 감사드리고요. 사실 제가 뭐그 다음에 이제 준비했던 질문에 대한 답을 이미 하셨다고 생각하는데, 그러니까 먼저 이제 그좀 보충 약간의 보충 설명을 드리면 이제 감독님께서 이제 그그 스탠 브라카주에 대해서 언급한 말하자면 이제 그 녹색을 언어로 배우 지식으로 배우지 않아도 녹색을 살펴볼 수 있는 알아볼 수 있는 아이의 눈에 대해서 말씀하신 부분 사실 이제 그뭐 스탠 브라카주의 이제 그 메타포로스온 비전 시각에 대한 은유라는 이제 그 그들의 코렉션 있죠 거기 나온 유명한 구절입니다 그 오프닝에 나오는 그리고 이제 프렘 그러니까 이제 감독님의 그 전에 인터뷰를 보면 사실 이제 그이 그러니까 브라카주나 프렘튼의 영화 못지않게 텍스트에도 많은 영향을 받으신 거 언급하는데 그러니까 뭐 브라카주의 텍스트는 지금 말씀드린 대로고 또 허리스 프램튼의 경우에는 뭐 서클스 오브 컴퓨전이라고 이제 그 어떻게 보면 프램튼은 사실 중요한 이론가이기도 했었기 때문에 실험 영화에서 이제 그 거기에 또 많은 영향을 받으셨다고 이제 언급을 한바 있습니다. 그리고 지금 이제 그래서 브라카주나 프램튼 어떤 두 축으로 말씀하신 부분은 사실 이제 그 감독님의 영화에 대한 지금까지 어떤 서고의 그러니까 그 영미권의 이제 그 어떤 실험 영화 연구의 이제 평가 어떤 비평적 평가하고 어느 정도 일치하는데 말하자면 그런 겁니다. 그러니까 한편에는 그러니까 영, 어떤 북미 아방가르드 영화의 어떤 두 가지 전통을 포괄을 했다. 첫 번째는 어떤 영화를 어떤 예술가의 개인적 표현으로 여기고 어떤 영화 제작을 개인의 어떤 의식 영혼을 세계를 탐구하는 것을 실천했던 사람들이 있죠. 브라카주가 그렇고 뭐 예를 들어 조나스 미카스, 나타나이 돌스키 뭐 이런 감독들이 있습니다. 어떻게 보면 낭만주의적 전통이라고 할수 있겠죠. 또 다른 전통은 영화를 어떤 개인적으로 이제 표현으로 취급한 것 대신에 영화의 본성과 과정을 좀 지적이고 물질적이고 말하자면 그런 식으로 이제 과정적으로 탐구를 하는 어떻게 보면 구조 영화 혹은 형식주의적 전통이라 할수 있는 그러는 어떤 또 하나의 전통이 있습니다. 뭐 프램튼이라든지 뭐 마이클 스노 등으로 대표가 되는 그러니까 이둘 사이에 두 개의 전통을 이 자기식으로 이제 포용해 오신 어떤 이제 그이 과정을 이제 그 이야기하는데 그런 어떤 비평적 평가와 이제 일치를 한다고 생각합니다. 그래서 뭐 자연스럽게 좀 초기 
그 자기에 대한 질문으로 넘어가겠습니다. 사실 아까도 말씀드렸지만 은 이번에 상영은 안 됐는데 감독님의 작품 세계를 이해하는 데 있어서 필수적인 좀 그런 작품들이 있습니다. 그러니까 가장 알려진 것은 그 연작 필름 프로젝트로 한국으로 번역한 구분선의 은밀한 역사 아까 말씀드린 아홉, 아홉 부로 이루어진 진실한 설명 뭐그 작품이 있는 그러니까 그 연작이 있는데 거기에 속한 작품이 예를 들어서 뭐 국내 한국어로 번역하자면 목순의 기계적 실행 또는 인쇄술에 적용된 수작업의 원칙들 예좀 감독님 그 작품 제목이 이미 아시면 좀 깁니다 예 그리고 독해 향유 잃은 것과 찾은 것 그리고 시크릿 히스토리 오브 더 디바이딩 라인 그 같은 제목에 그리고 아임의 위대한 기회라고 번역된 더 그레이트 아트 오브 노잉 이런 작품들이 속해, 속하게 됩니다. 그리고 이 작품들이 어떻게 보면 감독님의 그 어떻게 보면 좀이그 어떤 명성을 잘 알려지게 한 중요한 어떤 작품이 되었는데요. 그 연작의 어떤 의도와 제작 과정에 대해서 좀 예, 설명을 듣고자 합니다. Uh, this series uh, is very important and it is ongoing. Uh, I will hope to complete the series by 2028, uh, all nine parts uh, by that date. It contains within it the seeds of almost all of my other work that I have made since then. Uh, since when? So, uh, mm -hmm. Since I started the series in 1996. I'm interested in the way in which division and separation bind the separated parts into a new relationship. In 1728, a man named William Byrd was commissioned to lead an expedition to resolve the dispute about the boundary line between the colonies of North Carolina and Virginia. He wrote an account of this expedition, and it has become an important historical record of natural history, political history, uh, geographic history, uh, and social history. He is famous for those texts today that he wrote about that exhibition, but in his lifetime, he was most famous for his library. He had the largest number of books in North America at the beginning of the 18th century. I'm interested in his library of 4,000 books as a conceptual construct. He brought all of those books from England and France to North America, and they began to play a formation uh, of American intellectual identity during the colonial period. I'm interested in how he placed one book next to another book. He made up his own scheme of organization for these books. Each of the films in the series takes a particular book from William Byrd's library as the point of departure, as the inspiration for one of the nine films. William Byrd also had a daughter. Her name was Evelyn Byrd. And in 1723, she was taken to England to receive her formal education and be presented at court, as was the custom among wealthy colonists in the United States, in the, the colonies of the states. It was there that she met and fell in love with a man named Charles Mordaunt, but they had to keep their romance secret because the Mordaunts were Catholic, the birds were Protestant, and Lord Peterborough was Byrd's main political rival in England at the time. So it was a secret romance. Eventually, as all secret romances must be, they were found out. William Byrd was furious, and he sent Evelyn back to Virginia, where she refused any suitors. She very quickly, by the age of 21, became considered an old maid, unmarriable. But it turns out, that between 1726 and 1735, Evelyn Byrd and Charles Mordaunt carried on a secret transatlantic correspondence with letters being passed back and forth by people they trusted who were going back and forth across the ocean. Their only way of communication was through text. Not text messaging. Not text messaging, <laughs> letters, <laughs> writing. <laughs> the letters were the way they bridged the dividing line of the ocean. In 1735, Charles Mordaunt inherited his grandfather's money and traveled to the colonies under an assumed name, an alias, where he infiltrated Virginia society and made plans to rendezvous with Evelyn at the church down the road and to elope. They booked passage on a ship. Uh, what year? 1735. 
They booked passage on this ship with the help of William Byrd's secretary, a man who, it turns out, was also in love with Evelyn. They were betrayed by the secretary. Charles was tied up aboard the ship. Evelyn was prevented from getting to it. The ship sailed, and after nine years of waiting to be back together, the lovers were again separated. Two weeks later, Evelyn learned that the ship with Charles Mordaunt had been caught in a storm, had gone down, and that all aboard had perished. Evelyn was heartbroken. Evelyn had only one close friend, and she confessed to her close friend that she was so heartbroken she was sure she would not be able to survive this heartbreak. Two weeks later, Evelyn Byrd died of heart failure at the age of 29. The following spring, in April of 1738, was the first of 17 appearances of the ghost of Evelyn Byrd on and around the Westover estate between 1737 and 1969. That is the story. The partitioning of landscape through exploration, the separation of individuals across time and space, the line between the legible and the illegible, because it is the colonies in the 18th century, the way labor is divided by white people and Africans who are their slaves. All of these are kinds of division that have to be thought about because they create new relationships between formerly undifferentiated parts of land, between people who are separated, the legible and the illegible have a relationship, the relationship between life and death, and the in-between state of being a ghost, all of these kinds of separations, divisions, absences, and presences are the emotional core for almost all of my films. So far, the films have been about the library, the dividing line expedition, the love affair, and the ghost story. And I continue to make more of these films in the Secret History of the Dividing Line series. Very important to me. Uh, I always have them to work on even at the same time as I make many other films. I've, what, since, since starting on this series, I've made 23 other films not related to the Bird series, but the Bird series is always in my mind. And the emotional dynamics of it can be ma are manifested in other of the films, particularly in the films that we will see tomorrow afternoon. So if this story is of interest to you, some of the films tomorrow actually all, th all three of the films tomorrow have to do with this, this bird cycle. They are bits and pieces of the next secret history film, even as they are standalone films. So I'm very excited to show that, share those with you. 지금 말씀하신 이제 그 어떤 분리와 새로운 관계, 어떤 삶과 죽음, 가시적인 것과 비가시적인 것, 읽을 수 있는 것과 읽을 수 없는 것, 현존과 부재, 공존. 그런 것들이 어떻게 보면은 이제 그 감독님이 사실 그 여러 문학적인 어떤 텍스트들을 이제 그 끌어들이시는데 뭐 거기에는 나사날 호스온, 에드가 에런 포, 뭐 월트 위트먼 같은 이제 미국 문학의 전통은 물론이고 또 어떤 기억과 의식에 대한 어떤 탐구를 다른 뭐 어떤 영미권과 유럽 모더니즘 문학의 전통들 예를 들면 뭐 거트 스타인이라든지 해리 제임스 뭐 심지어 이제 프루스트까지도 이제 환기시키는 그런 어떤 이제 감독의 어떤 문학적 취향과 또 긴밀히 연관되지 않을까라는 이제 그 생각을 이제 그 했습니다. 그 이외에도 사실 이제 그 어떻게 보면은 그러니까 이런 어떤 문학적인 것과 정서적인 것과 더불어서 그 감독님의 이제 그이 연작들 맞아 이제 그 디바이딩 라인 연작에는 사실 이제 그 영화 이전의 미디어 특히 어떤 인쇄 미디어에 대한 이제 그 관심이 뚜렷이 드러납니다. 예를 들어서 그 목숨의 기계적 실행에서는 구텐베르크의 인쇄술을 다루셨고 그 다른 이제 그 구분선의 은밀한 역사 연작을 이룬 작품에서도 뭐 글쓰기 말씀하신 것처럼 서적, 도서관과 같은 프린트드 미디어에 대한 관심이 이제 그 반영이 되어 있죠. 그래서 이제 그 어떤 영화 그런 영화 이전 어떤 프리 시네마틱한 그런 미디어의 역사 흔적을 일종의 어떤 고고학적 어떤 아케올로지컬하게 복원한 것이 감독님의 영화가 어떤 가져온 어떤 또 다른 기획이 아닐까. 라는 생각을 했는데 어떻게 보면 영화 이전 미디어를 어떻게 영화가 다루는가에 대한 어떤 질문이 되겠죠. 예, 거기에 대한 어떤 좀 의견을 좀 
감독님께 들어보고자 합니다. One of the reasons, uh, everything is, this is all correct. I love, I love books, I love the printed word, I go poetry, uh, both on the printed page and recited aloud as, as almost song, uh, is, is, are, are both major influences on my work. What I find very interesting about putting words on screen is that they retain the graphic materiality of looking at the printed page, but because they exist in time, they also have the value of spoken word. They have rhythm, they have cadence, they disappear. And so deciding how long a word stays on screen, the amount of time it takes to fade out slowly or cut very hard, is a way of producing speech rhythms on screen while retaining, retaining the graphics of what language looks like. It's a way of making something that you know is language either legible by leaving enough time for it to be read or illegible by taking it away before you can read it. 이와 같은 이제 그 문학, 어떻게 보면 그 지식, 그 역사, 그 텍스트성과 더불어서 감독님의 영화에서 또 이제 어떤 다른 어떤 감독님이 아까 또 강조를 하신 어떤 키워드인 흔, 흔적, 어떤 이제 그 중요한 어떤 흔적의 대상이 된 것이 사실 자연입니다. 감독님의 또 다른 어떤 연작 중에 이제 그 물이 말했던 것, 와터 워터셀이라는 이제 원작 연작도 있고 이번에 이제 그 상영된 그 사실 오늘 상영됐던 작품인데 뭐 고통과 가군. 그리고 체집의 알바리스크에 따라 By Pain and Rhyme of an Arabesque of Boraging 뭐 그런 작품이라든지 맨 가장 최근 작품인 그 갑자기 발생하는 사태에 대한 면상 Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions 여기서도 사실 이제 그 자연적 대상들에 대한 그런 이제 그 식물 뭐그 전작들을 보면 새도 있고 여러 이제 그 어떤 자연적 대상에 대한 관심이 이제 들어있는데 어떻게 보면 이제 그 이런 자연에 대한 관심이 어디서 비롯된 것인지 this raises a very important question. What use is cinema in the 21st century? Why do we still make films? Most commercial films, which are most films, are made to entertain or to inform. They have a pre- uh, 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 pre-thought outcome. The, the outcome is determined in advance. This should be a hit. This should convince someone of something. I am interested in using the materials and the apparatus of cinema not to manifest my vision, but to explore, genuinely to experiment to put something into the world and see what the world gives back. For 30 years, I have been going with my family to the intersection of the Edisto River in South Carolina, where it empties into the Atlantic Ocean, going to the beach there and watching the dolphins eat and the crabs run around and the waves crash and the seaweed and jellyfish wash up on the shore. And while I was in graduate school, I wanted to make a work to commemorate, to honor this place that has meant so much to me throughout my life. I didn't want to document this place in the normal way where I might set up a camera and film or take out a microphone and record the wind. I wanted to try to give up authorial control, to let the natural world make part of the film itself. So I threw all of my 16 millimeter film stock into the ocean in a crab trap to let the ocean, the salt water, the shells, the crabs, the waves, the fish, mark and chew uh, and inscribe experience onto that film stock. Then I would pull in with the rope, the crab trap, and whatever came out of the crab trap, that is the movie. That is what the water said. 
it, because 16 millimeter is an optical sound format, it made not only image of scratches or chemical reactions, but also the sound of those scratches and reactions. I was just the producer, no directing. The ocean edited the film. The crabs did the cinematography. And you didn't have to pay them. Uh, and, and they worked for free. I did this nine times in 1997 and nine more times in 2006. And each time, the ocean said something completely different. In my recent work, I have also dealt with natural processes by painting uh, and putting pigments on the film, letting that film freeze, uh, bake in the sun, be rained on. Uh, and I did some work, and the world did some work. I like the idea of a conversation with the world. I like to give up control at some times, and then I like to exert control other times. I like most of all to edit. I did not edit what the water said. I just repaired broken sprockets. But all of my other films, I take lots of control with editing, even if I let the other parts of the process happen on their own with the world and leave the traces of the natural world. To me, it seems like an honest way to live and a way to accept that we cannot control everything. The most beautiful things are often the things that cannot be repeated, that will never happen again. All of us will never be together again, just like this, in this room. This is a unique moment in all of our lives, and I want my cinema to honor those circumstances. 지금 끝에 말씀하신 이제 그 최근작 어떻게 보면 자연의 그런 이제 그 예, 변화하는 효과를 이제 그 어떻게 보면 그러니까 감독이 감독님이 개인적 그러니까 통제를 하지 않고 자연적인 효과를 이제 맞으면 이제 그 비의도적으로 자동적으로 이제 그 필름에 이제 기입하고 그 변화를 기록하는 방식은 사실 이제 오늘 상영된 그 브루클린 나르토를 건너며 크로스인 브루클린 페리 같은 작품에서도 이제 관찰할 수 있는 것이고요. 예, 그러면서 그런 이제 그 여러 질요들이 어떤 식으로 이제 그 변하고 그 질감이 어떻고 그런 어떤 이제 물질적 효과 심지어 그런 것들에 영향을 미치는 어떤 온도와 습도의 느낌 그런 것들은 이제 그 감독님의 이제 그 최근 대작 이번에 상영된 눈부신 그림자들에서 사실 관찰할 수 있는 것이라고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 이 작품에 대한 어떤 질문들을 좀 드리고자 하는데 우선 떠오를 수 있는 것은 이 그러니까 영화와 아무래도 회화에 대한 관, 그들 사이의 관계가 되겠죠. 직접 이제 그 페인팅한 장면이 나오기 때문에 그리고 그 자체가 어떻게 보면 이제 그 20세기 이제 추상회화 어떻게 보면 미니멀리즘 회화를 연상시키는 그런 식의 이제 느낌을 풍기기 때문에요. 예, 그래서 이 어떤 영화 회화의 관계에 대한 어떤 감독님의 좀 생각을 좀 들어볼 수 있지 않을까 합니다. 예. Yes, in, in 1998, I had an idea to make a movie that would condense the texts of many other authors to create a single story. Henry James, Maurice Blanchot, Wallace Stevens, Stefan Zweig, uh, and a few more. So I started writing in 1998. The story was all about the way in which time passes. And so I, I didn't want to just put words on screen. I wanted to create an image in which you could also see time passing. And it's almost a joke uh, because my film is in some ways largely about watching paint dry. As the paint dries, words appear, and you can read a love story that takes place over 30 years that has to do with separation and the telegraph and writing, many of the themes, the subject matter that I've been interested in since I started on the bird films. I always knew this would not be a film 
because the takes would be so long to watch the paint dry that it had to be, in 1998, I thought, video, VHS, and then mini DV, and then digital videotape, and finally I shot it on a DSLR where I could have 40-minute takes. I live in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, above 7,000 feet on a mountain, where there is very little humidity, and so the paint dries very, very fast. You can see it dry in a matter of seconds. Crack and blister, it's very dramatic. It's actually, it actually is fun to watch paint dry. In addition to choosing the colors very carefully, I chose different kinds of paint, oil-based enamel or water-based acrylic that would dry at different rates. They don't like each other, so they fight in how they dry. That made it even more dramatic, and it created paintings that, that look in some ways like abstract expressionist paintings of the era of Barnett Newman or Mark Rothko, uh, or Jules Olitsky, uh, Joan Mitchell, uh, but I could not control those. The paint made the paintings based on its own physical properties. I didn't try and paint an image. The paint worked with itself to make the image. And so even though I am not working with the surface of the film, and letting the water and the ocean and the film emulsion interact, I am still interested in what happens when you put different kinds of materials into proximity and allow them to work on their own. So in some ways, the extravagant shadows comes from the same impulse as what the water said. Marilyn Rush라는 그 60년대 이제 그 가수 이제 미국 가수의 그 저의 알려진 곡이죠. 그 Angel of the Morning 그 포함한 네 곡을 거기서 쓰셨어요. 다른 작품들은 다 무성이지만요. 보셨듯이. 자, 이 음악을 사용한 이유 특별히 이 영화에 대해서. 예. Ah, this is a good question. Uh, you may have to see the movie to to really uh, understand. I don't want to give away too much, but I will give away some. Um, this movie, The Extravagant Shadows, is very long compared to my other films. Most of my, my other longest film, The Great Art of Knowing, was only 37 minutes. The Extravagant Shadows is 175. That sounds long, but it doesn't feel that long, I hope. The Extravagant Shadows, which you can see in the booklet, is one of spines of books on a shelf. And they are all writers that deal with love, but their level of sophistication with language is very different. Henry James is a very precise writer. He is on the far left of the frame. As the, the books go across, the writing gets a little bit sillier, more poppy, more generic less classical. And one of, I am interested in this 1968 album by Merrily Rush, Angel of the Morning, in which some of the songs are brilliant, like Henry James, and some of them are ridiculous, like some of the other books over here. So what I was interested in doing was evoking different ways language can be used, both written language and sung language, to address the question of love. I also thought in a movie of 175 minutes, it is nice to have some songs. I have very few ideas about sound, but I did have the idea that it shouldn't only be written words, there should be music and there should be song in this long love story space. It allows viewers to breathe. Sometimes silence can be oppressive, can be difficult. And for three hours, huh, sometimes you feel like you can't move or breathe, and that's not good. I want everyone to relax and experience the work the way you experience reading a book. Most books have no soundtrack, 
but it's never completely silent when you read them. Books are quiet. There may be lots of sound around us. Sometimes we read books in a coffee shop and there's music playing. My movie is like that. But the songs are chosen for very particular reasons at very particular moments. 그 눈부신 그림자들은 또한 이제 그 아까 이제 DSLR 카메라 말씀하셨는데 감독님이 셀룰로이드 대신에 그러니까 디지털 테크놀로지를 활용했다는 점에서도 중요한데요. 그러니까 이 촬영에서 DSLR을 사, 사용하셨고 그리고 그 작품에서 볼수 있는 어떤 미묘한 그런 색채와 빛의 변화가 있는데 그 그게 어떻게 보면 디지털의 그런 후반 작업, 포스트 프로덕션 과정을 거친 걸로 이제 보이는데 그런 좀 디지털 프로세스에 대해서 좀 궁금하고 그런 디지털의 어떤 테크놀로지와 프로세스가 셀루이드로 작업했을 때와 비교했을 때 어떤 어떤 스페시픽한 독특한 이제 효과를 낳았는지 예, 그 점에 대해서 여쭙고자 합니다. Well, first I will say that um, there is actually no digital processing. The, the, the color, the shifts in color are due to the clouds passing across the sun and changing the natural color temperature of the light. I set the white balance at the beginning and never changed it. And I filmed from sunrise to sunset on a, on a day in which clouds were moving very fast. So when colors seem to change, that wasn't, again, that wasn't me. That was the natural world changing the color temperature of, of the light. So you didn't use any kind of color correction? No. Final technique. No. So uh, the only thing I did is, because all of the takes were between 30 and 40 minutes, I would make a dissolve. It all happens in real time. There is no, uh, there is no time lapse. All of the paint is drying in real time. The, the compositing of the text and image is really the only post-production to do. It was very easy to edit because it was shot in order and I just had to superimpose the text. So very simple editing. I'm very, very happy with the extravagant shadows. In some ways, I think it is the most important movie that I have made. But aside from actually painting and writing, editing on a computer is very boring. There is no poetry in click, click. I don't like the physical process. I don't like just sitting there looking at the screen. That almost drove me crazy. Part of the reason I love working with film is that it is much harder it resists the world. You have to have faith. You shoot, you can't see it right away. You can't rewind. You have to process it, either yourself or at a lab. I work with reversal film, no work print. So first cut is also the final cut, zero levels of undo. I have to be certain. Sometimes I might make only three cuts a day. Working on digital computer, people could make three cuts a minute. I like that film slows down my life. I work with a cement splicer, very delicate process. Scrape the emulsion, put down the cement, close the splicer, wait 90 seconds for it to dry. Sweep up the emulsion, drink some tea, look at the clouds. I want a filmmaking practice that makes my life better and slower and more contemplative. I'm very happy with the outcome of Extravagant Shadows, but I very much like the process of making sprocketed celluloid films. It feeds my soul. I feel poetry in working with rewinds, standing over chemicals in the dark room with the red lights above me. That is when I am, that's when I feel most myself. My wife and I live at 7,000 feet in the mountains and we have chosen to raise our daughter there. We have electricity only part of the time. We heat all with wood stove. I chop all of our firewood and haul it in. Uh, internet, maybe one day out of 10. Uh, telephone, two days out of 10. Uh, we live like it is another century, the 19th century. It means things are very slow. I edit my films sometimes by candlelight because there is no electricity. 
Uh, we heat the kettle on the stove. Uh, it makes life slow, and it makes you very aware of what the temperature is outside, uh, how, much, how much wood it takes to stay warm, uh, how long it takes to cook food on an open flame as opposed to a microwave. Uh, I do not have a cell phone. Uh, my wife does not have a cell phone. We, we do, neither of us have had television since the 1980s when we were children. We are living a different kind of life, and our filmmaking, uh, I think, reflects that. 이제 간단한 뭐 질문 두 개만 드리고 이제 그이 예, 관객과의 대화로 넘어가 오자는데요. 예, 많은 실험 영화 감독들은 이제 그 되게 개인적인 그 표현을 사실 자신의 영화를 남기기도 하죠. 어떤 영화를 이제 그 개인 가까운 개인에게 바치거나 그래서 이번에 상영작에도 아내 에린이라든지 딸에게 바치는 그런 영화들이 있었습니다. 그, 그 중에서 이제 그 이, Narrow River Open Seas and Seventeen Sunsets 그러니까 좁은 강 열린 바다 17개의 노을은 작년 6월에 이제 그 타계한 그러니까 실험 영화 감독인 피터 후튼을 추목한 추모한 작품입니다. 비록 국내에는 뭐 이렇게 그 많이 소개는 되지 않았지만 피터 후튼은 뭐가 또 사라지는 풍경 일단 어떤 엄밀하고도 시적인 기록을 추구했던 이제 실험 영화 감독이었고요. 그래서 어떤 후튼의 영화 그리고 그와의 어떤 기억이 이제 이 영화에 미친 영향을 이제 한번 그 궁금해서 한번 여쭤보고자 합니다. Yes, I, I, Peter Hutton uh, and I were, uh, continued to make silent films. And we met, we met in the mid-90s when not that many people were making silent films. And so always at film festivals, our films would be shown next to each other to have a period of silence. Uh, and so we became friends. Uh, Peter uh, was um, 70 when he died. I'm 45. So we were different generations. Uh, but we shared um, uh, an affection for things that were passing away, that were disappearing. Uh, and Peter helped teach me how to see, how to look, uh, and how to transform the world through his choice of composition and his use of black and white film stock. I learned a great deal from Peter. And the last time we saw each other was in November. Uh, he passed away in June. Uh, we talked about sunsets as being uh, imagery that could be sometimes problematic uh, because it could be too pretty, too much like a postcard, uh, and especially color sunsets could be um, uh, hard, hard to work with, hard to get past uh, the gloss of a sunset, the idea of a sunset. But we, we made a plan that we would, we'd both shot a lot of sunsets because they can be very beautiful. And we made a plan to exchange our sunset roles. Uh, but Peter died before that was able to happen. And so in the 72 hours after his death, before his memorial service, which I could not travel to, um, I made this short film of 17 sunsets. Uh, that I would have shown Peter if we were able to exchange films. And for me, the longer I make films, the more I am making films for a particular person, an individual. And I consider them not letters. A letter uh, you write, and then you seal it up in an envelope, and it goes to the person, and they, they open it. It's only for them. I think of my films for other people more like postcards. They are addressed to a person, but they are available to be read by anyone who picks it up. And so in the, in the tradition of Stan Brakhage or Jonas Mekas uh, or Joyce Wieland, uh, a number of filmmakers who worked autobiographically and shared moments of their life. Gunvor Nelson, uh, another very important one. Sue Friedrich. There are many. This is, this is not something that I do. This is a whole tradition in cinema, in the same way that many poems are dedicated to particular people. I now feel that there are some things I can say only through cinema. And that is a reason to make a film. 예, 그 말씀하신 전통은 사실 이제 그 예, 자서전적 영화, 오토바이오그래피가 필름의 이제 전통 이제 그 말씀하신 거 예고요. 예, 어, 저한 가지 질문이 더 있는데 이거는 뭐 마지막에 제가 그 마치면서 해도 좋을 것 같아서 예, 지금은 이제 지금부터 
이제 여러분들한테 이제 그 대화를 할수 있는 시간으로 이제 그 이제 드리도록 하겠습니다. 손을 들어주시고 예 말씀해 주십시오. 예 먼저 저기 그맨 앞에 계신 분 저기 좀 예. 일단 우선 제가 눈부신 그림자들에서 들었던 노래하고 그 노래 제목하고 가사 아그 가수 이름을 좀 알고 싶어요. 제가 검색해봐도 안 돼가지고 좀 듣고 싶거든요. 계속 엄청 좋아가지고 아까 말씀하셨는데 메릴린 아, 러시하고 저기 그, 그 엔젤 오브 더 모닝에 있는 데고 써드릴게요. 네 그리고 이거 눈부신 그림자들 같은 영화를 만들어주셔서 고맙다는 말씀까지 전해드릴게요. Thank you very much. That means a lot to me. Um, I probably won't be able to name all five, but I can tell you that they are all on the same 1968 album by Marilee Rush. The first one is Angel on My Shoulder. Another one is uh, Angel of the Morning. Another one is Love Street. Uh, another one is Observations from an Airplane in 3-4 Time. And I believe the last one is called simply Sand Castles. But all on that album, you'll recognize them. Uh, I'm still not seeing the young people who are in the same way. So, two of them are going to be able to talk to each other. I'm going to be able to talk to each other. 설명하실 때 이미지와 텍스트 간의 관계에 관해서 어, 설명을 조금 이제 하셨는데 제가 듣기로는 그 관점이 은하학에서 말하는 사피에 앤드 워프 가설을 어느 결정 논쟁인 관점을 어느 정도는 받아들이고 또또 또 어느 정도는 또 부정하는 그런 입장에 서 계신 걸로 생각이 되는데 그런 어떤 그 가설과 연관해 가지고 그런 사고를 하시게 되, 된 것인지 질문 드리고 싶고 두 번째는 어, 선생님의 뭐 여러 가지 영상 작품 중에 이제 예를 들어 가지고 필름의 어떤 그 자연이 가하는 물리적인 흔적들을 통해 가지고 표현하셨다고 이렇게 하는데 제가 현대 미술에 좀 관심이 있다고 보니까 현대 미술의 어떤 미술사적인 흐름과 연관시켜서 볼때 그것은 어떤 의미에서는 어, 뭐 르네상스 이후에 19세기 말까지의 어떤 재현주의 미술, 그 환영주의 미술을 거부하고 어, 이차원적인 어떤 그 캔버스의 어떤 평면성을 강조해 가지고 나타난 추상회화적인 방식을 원형을 해 가지고 영화에서 어떤 추상영화적인 것을 추구하려고 한 것이 아닌가 저는 그렇게 이야기하는 이해하는데 선생님은 어떻게 생각하시는지 좀 묻고 싶습니다. 예, 그첫 번째 질문하신 질문 감사드리고 그첫 번째 질문하신 거에서 지금 문학에서 어떤 가설을 말씀하셨는데 그 말씀하셨는데 그걸 좀 분명히 좀 다시 한번 좀 말씀해 주셨습니다. 아, 사피엔 워프 가설이라고 해가지고 어느 결정론적인 어, 그런 그 가설이 있는데 에드워드 사피어 앤 워프 해가지고 어, 그 아, 은우의 그 가설, 은우의 해가지고 그 대상세 모르신데요. 예, 알겠습니다. 예, 보스 관계 두 번째 예. 질문만 좀 답변을 해주시죠. Thank you very much for asking. Those, those, those good, are good things for me to think about. Um, I always grew up being very comfortable with image and text being on screen together because I watched international cinema. Akira Kurosawa, Jean-Luc Godard, Francois Truffaut, Ingmar Bergman, always subtitles. And so for me, I know that, that the image and the text activate two different parts of the brain, but I am used to and enjoy activating both parts of my brain as a film viewer and as a filmmaker. The other thing that interests me about text on screen, as, a th as I don't know if this is, this is not so much theoretical, but you always know when the text should come off the screen, when it's been read, when you, when you can read it. With a tree, how long does a tree last? Harder to say. So I like activating those different parts of the brain. The most important theorist for my thinking about not only text, but different kinds of frustration in cinema is a book called The Pleasure of the Text by Roland Barthes from 1968 or 69, where he differentiates between texts of pleasure 
and texts of bliss. The text of pleasure, Roland Barthes says, is one which confirms all of our normal reading habits. It makes us comfortable. We are entertained. There is, there is nothing boring about it. It moves us along. A text of bliss, on the other hand, can cause a crisis. It, it breaks with our culture as we know it. It may cause frustration. Uh, it may cause confusion, from which comes frustration. Uh, but he argues that a text of bliss is actually the more productive reading experience because it makes us reflect back on ourselves and, and work with the text to create meaning. So I am always interested in texts of bliss because it, a text of bliss contains pleasure, but you must go through discomfort, sometimes pain, and you must work to achieve your bliss. That, to me, is a much more meaningful aesthetic and art experience. I also like uh, Jacques Derrida's Archive Fever uh, and uh, many books by Deleuze, especially Le Pli, The Fold, on Baroque theory. Mm -hmm. But they're not linguistics. Uh, Umberto Eco, another uh, linguist mm -hmm. whose work I like. And then I'll talk about nature. <laughs> uh, uh, Deleuze. Yes. Yeah. Gilles uh, Deleuze. Yeah, 그 주름으로 번역이 돼 있습니다. 예, 주드레. 우리 보통 이제 주드레즈로 쓰죠, 우리는요. 예. So I beg your pardon? Oh, do you want to add something? Oh no, just I'll just talk about nature for a minute because I think that the whole history of art, before and after the Renaissance, most artists have tried to capture nature and create an ideal vision of nature. And my interest is less in uh, representations of nature than interactions with nature. I want it to affect me, not to create a platonic ideal of nature. Uh, I, am, I, I try to respond, and not that other artists weren't responding, uh, but my, my thinking about nature is probably more in line with Stan Brakhage's when he made moth light and taped to on, put on splicing tape the wings of dead moths and tiny little flowers and blades of grass. And he made those into a composition, but he was responding to the nature that was around him, not attempting to control it, but to honor it or to respond to it. So it's, I think it's not the same. Um, I have much sympathy with modernist aesthetics. I'm interested in modernism. I am probably not a modernist. I have, I have modernist tendencies classicist tendencies and postmodernist tendencies, and I don't know what to make of all of that. Uh, he can tell me what that all means. <laughs> Maybe even the best, uh, even better than Mothlight, my favorite painting uh, is by uh, a Dutch painter of still lives from the 16th century called Adrian Korta, and he painted uh, he would usually paint one kind of berry or fruit in a traditional still life on a ledge. And he has one very beautiful painting of white asparagus. And this is now 400 years old. The kind of white paint that he used has started to fade. So it is no longer just white asparagus. The painting has interacted with time. And now it is the ghost of white asparagus because it, you can see through it. It is translucent. I love that kind of interaction with the world, that time has worked on the painting and produced a brand new meaning. That makes me very happy. Yeah, Thank you. 
나레이션 나오고 텍스트 나오고 나중에 문자들도 몇 개가 나오면서 그거를 잘 음미하다 보면 아 이러이러한 그 우리 그 추상적인 것이 오히려 구체화되는 그런 부분도 있을 수 있지만 관객은 그게 자연이 아니라 문자 이런 경우에는 오히려 내가 텍스트를 이렇게 같이 따라서 이렇게 보는 데 있어서 어떤 나의 생각을 규정해 버린다고 잘못 받아들일 수도 있을 것 같아요. 그러니까 감독님께서 생각하신 소통의 방식이 자칫 또 관객들에게는 그게 문자라는 측면에서 규제되는 것 같은 딱그 어감으로 받아들여 버릴 수 있을 것 같아서 그 감독님의 그 의도를 잘 받아들이기 위해서는 어떤 점들이 좀 필요한지 그러니까 제가 영화를 봤는데 중간에 한두 분이 아 이거 그냥 책 읽는 거 아닌가 그러고는 쓱 이게 무관심하신 그러니까 의외로 그걸 잘 따라가야 되는데 가, 간혹 문자라는 측면이 오히려 규제된다는 느낌을 받아버리는 초보적인 관객은 그런 부분 어려움에 대해서는 또 어떻게 우리가 받아들이고 또 소통할 수 있을까 <웃음> 그 점이 궁금합니다. She said your film was hard to understand. Okay. Yes. Sorry, just a little bit. Okay. I'm just kidding. So I agree. Okay. I, and what was your intention? Yes, I agree completely that it is it is a very strong gesture and very um, uh, maybe uh, it is very controlling to make an audience read at my pace instead of your pace. You don't get to decide. You don't get to look back. Uh, it is uh, almost authoritarian in that way. The way I think about it is as a composition. I am making a composition in time the way a musician might make a composition in time. And so it is my hope that there is frustration, that there is struggle. Not everything will be understood because I have regulated the composition. You might be tired. You might close your eyes and miss something. It is a negotiation. Most cinema doesn't want any negotiation. The meaning comes off the screen and goes all the way to the back of the theater. If you don't understand Star Wars, then they've made it badly. Star Wars is supposed to be understood. My movies, don't come all the way off the screen. My movies will come, some of my movies come this far, some of my movies will come this far, but you then have to come up here and wrestle and be engaged in a different way than we are used to with cinema. It is perhaps more like music in that respect than reading a book. So I am very comfortable with the fact that my movies create tension frustration, uh, anxiety, uh, but hopefully they make you think about your relationship to the screen instead of forget about your relationship to the screen. And it is when we have image makers and governments who want to make us forget who's in charge that's when we end up with bad political situations. When, it, when the authority is very clear and there is a chance to struggle, you can't change my composition, but you can struggle with it. You retain your agency. You are you, the film is the film. That, makes, that reminds us that we are all individuals involved in a negotiation. And that to me is very important. The other thing I will say in terms of my expectation is that I know, I know, I plan for this. And there are some filmmakers who feel like to be a filmmaker, you make a film. Filmmakers don't just, making films is not what makes you a filmmaker. To be a filmmaker, you must make the film. You must put it out into the world to have a conversation. It is the responsibility of a filmmaker or any artist to advocate for what one believes is the best about cinema. It is about being in the world. And so I don't consider my film to be over when the lights come up. This, what we are doing right now, is also the work of the film. This is being a filmmaker right now. Films exist to activate a social space in my conception, not to make us forget. 
that we are in a social space. So I, I want that struggle. And I think that with time, with familiarity, with seeing this kind of cinema more, just like some forms of classical music, you start to understand the compositions, can appreciate the compositions, can live inside them, and they become more meaningful. But it is not, um, I don't, I don't, I, I, I will tell you how to see, or I will show you things, but you have to decide what your experience is and remain yourself. I'm going to two of you, the good questions, actually, collectively, about the text of the book. 뭐 그냥 보충적으로 말씀드리면 이제 그 아까 텍스트 오브 브리스를 이제 그 텍스트 오브 플레저하고 이제 대비해서 사실 그 책에서의 어떤 중요한 어떤 두 개의 구분이긴 합니다. 말씀하셨는데 그 브리스가 사실 이제 그 원래 이제 그 바르트 그러니까 프랑스 원어는 사실 그 주이상스고요. 그러니까 사실 이제 그그 락강은 저기 정심석학과 이제 그 지젝 그 라인에서 이제 그뭐 향유로 번역이 되는 사실 이제 그 단어이기도 하죠. 그래서 그 텍스트 오브 브리스라는 게 이제 그 바르트에 따르면은 그 독자의 어떤 역사적이거나 어떤 문화적이거나 심리적인 어떤 가정을 뒤흔드는 심지어 어떻게 보면 그 상실의 상태를 부과하는 그런 이제 텍스트로 이제 그이 텍스트 오브 플레저와 이제 구분을 해서 사실 이야기합니다. 그런 맥락에서 이제 좀이 말씀하신 것도 있고 그런 또 대화가 진행이 됐다고 생각이 들고요. 예, 그럼 다음 저기 그저 질문 받도록 하겠습니다. 예, 저는 어 사진하고 영상을 공부하고 있는 학생인데 그. 저는 보통 작업을 지금 할때 어, 텍스트에 그러니까 이미지가 텍스트에 갇히지 않도록 노력을 하면서 작업을 해왔거든요. 그런 거에 스트레스를 좀 받으면서 왜냐하면 아까 언어를 모르는 아이가 그린을 몰랐을 때더 다양한 풀의 구상을 할수 할수 있고 또 아까 관객의 입장에서도 어, 텍스트가 어떤 억압을 줄 수도 있고 공격성을 띌 수도 내는 상황이 있잖아요. 근데 그럼에도 불구하고 어, 텍스트를 갖고 있는 이미지 또는 영화를 만드는 매력 혹은 어떤 효과 그런 거에 대해서 궁금해요. 왜냐면 어, 어, 앞으로 그런 걸 조금 만들어 보고 싶기도 하고 그래서 질문 드렸습니다. I think you are right. It is it is often an imposition on the image and it closes off possibilities for perception, experience, and meaning. What I like best in relationships of image and text is when there is confusion about what the relationship is. And so in some of my works, I am trying to give you information that is clear. But in some of my works, I am trying to produce a series of questions that can exist between the image and the text. Most films have text in the form of a title. To me, the least interesting titles are those that describe the film. And the most interesting titles are the ones that provoke a question about what the images mean. So I continue to balance, to try and negotiate between information and suggestion, evocation, and description. I have lately, since The Extravagant Shadows, my films have less text. I am trying to make films with fewer words because I am, I am trying to, I am now opening up a different space in my own mind at this stage of my life. But I continue to be compelled by the power of words to be ambiguous in the way that images can be ambiguous and that it creates a place for you, the viewer, to do some work to make those negotiations. I love language as a way of conveying meaning and so I always want to set that against another system of representation, the, the, the camera's representation of, the, of a world. Uh, I'm interested in the competition between two systems of representation. I struggle with it also. 
I struggle with it most in other people's films that use text. Sometimes they make me angry. Sometimes I just want to see films with no text because they're hard. And yet, when I sit down to make a work, my questions usually have something to do with image and text. And that is the field I have to plow. That's my work. That's what I've been given to do. Sometimes I wish I could n have no more words, ever. Just images. But that's, that would be dishonest to how I approach cinema. So it has to be both. But it's a struggle for me, too. I wish you productive struggles. <웃음> 생산적인 그런 고생을 하시기 바랍니다. 100년 전의 스펙트럼으로만 봐도 그 꽤나 꽤나 멋진 무성 영화 감독들이 있고 영화의 별이 된 분들이 있고 뭐 수많은 이론가들이 뭐 있지만 그 저는 이 부분에 초점을 맞추고 싶은데 저는 21세기 사람인데 그 저한테는 저한테는 20세기 분들이죠. 100년 전이라고 보면 그분들이 그분들은 그 현대 음악이든 뭐든 현장에서 싸워서 얻었고 근데 저는 그래도 관객 입장이에요. 그래서 어떻게 보면 어떻게 보면 옛날의 말들일 수도 있는데 어떻게 좀 길을 잃지 않고 찾아가는 방법들만 좀 방법론만 좀 같이 고민을 했으면 좋겠습니다. I think it must have always felt like that at every moment because I think that's how history works. We create a narrative. History is a narrative. It's tidy. We can understand it. But the present is always confusing. I felt the same way when I started making films in the early 90s. I thought I, w I understood the history and the categories, but then I thought, and what now? So we are constantly having to discover this for ourselves. And it helps me to study cinema history to see how filmmakers arrived at their answers in the midst of World War I, World War II, post May 68 in France. I try and understand how other filmmakers dealt with the chaotic events of their time. And I try and absorb those lessons. Our solutions have to be different. We live in different times. But there is one thing that I think is constant and is always the job of artists, of filmmakers, and really of all humans in whatever form of cultural production they engage in. There is a famous line by the theorist Theodore Adorno that is often taken out of context. Uh, and the, the part that is often quoted is he writes that after the Holocaust, it is barbar barbaric to write poetry. And he, didn't, he, he qualified that later. But what he was suggesting is culture was not enough to stop the Holocaust. Culture has never been enough to stop all of the terrible things that have happened throughout history. But Paul Celan, the poet, replied to Adorno and said, after Auschwitz, the ultimate barbarism would be to not write poetry. Celan believed that no matter how terrible the world was, and no matter the ways in which culture and art might not be able to prevent tragedies and catastrophes from happening, he believed that we must be witnesses, that we must articulate and present to others our subjectivities of the world. Paul Salon ultimately committed suicide. He ultimately he became hopeless at the end of his life. But the last three lines he wrote encompass, I think, much of what I believe about art and filmmaking. Ceylon wrote, pour the wasteland into your eye sacks, the call to sacrifice, the salt flood, 
Come with me to breath and beyond. And what I think he means is pour the wasteland into your ice axe. Open your eyes and witness what is happening around us that is terrible in the world. And understand that because you witness, you have been called to sacrifice some part of yourself. The salt flood, that won't be easy. There will be tears. Come with me to breath. Breath. The poet's breath is the way of articulating something. You must comment on this. But then he says, come to me with breath and beyond. Articulation is not enough. We must also act. It's, it's good to observe, to witness, to have empathy through tears, to articulate in art, but we must also act. And so we are in a very, we are in a, a, a you know what's happened in the United States. The country sort of lost its mind. There are lots of terrible things happening in 2017 in governments all over the world. You know what's happened in the United States, the Philippines, what could happen in France, troubles here. It's, there, is no, there is no shortage of things to witness. But I think that doesn't mean that all of our subject matter has to be about uh, conflict, tragedy, government, and activism. We often confuse subject with content. And I think that form plus subject matter equals content. There's always a way, the way in which you say something produces the content, whatever that thing is. Content experienced is meaning. And we are, are I think, at a wonderful point in history for art making in that the critics, the curators, are not telling artists there is only one right way to do something. In America, in the 1950s, you had uh, Rosenberg and uh, Clement Greenberg saying there is only one right way to paint. And if you don't do this, then it's bad art. Right now, there are lots of different options for us to act. And we can produce important and life-giving work through many different subject matters, many different forms that produce all kinds of contents and create meaning that helps sustain us in life. So I would say that your job, my job, all of our jobs as artists uh, or filmmakers, people, writers, teachers, anything, is to find what it is we can do best to make a contribution. Where does your chance for greatness lie? What is it that you, what is your contribution going to be? And then let no power or persuasion deter you in your task to carry that out. That is all of our jobs. It is not easy, it takes years. For me, it took at least 10 years to understand. I was making films, I was teaching, I was putting on film programs, but it took time for me for it all to come together and to understand where my place is. So I'm glad that you're thinking about these questions now. And if you keep thinking about them, the answer will come. 감독님과 대화를 하면서 사실 이 홀로코스트 이후에 시 혹은 예술에 대한 그 유명한 뭐 테오도 아도르노와 또 파울 체란의 그런 이제 그 이, 되게 논쟁적인, 어떻게 지금까지 논쟁도 이, 되고 있는 그런 이제 그 텍스트까지 이렇게 또 연장될 줄은 몰랐거든요. 아주 좋은, 되게 많은 것을 생각하게 하는 대화인 것 같습니다. 그래서 그 코멘트와 또 답변에 감사드리고요. 감독님 만나 뵙게 돼서 반갑고요. 어, 감독님 삶하고 작품하고 같이 동일한 선상에서 보여서 너무 좋았습니다. 어 근데 제가 이제 궁금한 것은 묵음 처리한 것이 소리를 이미지화 하기 위하여서 그렇게 한 걸로 알고 있는데 계속 그렇게 어 하실 것인지 조금 청각적인 자연 현장의 소리를 그대로 들려주면은 어 조금 더 입체적이지 않을까 그런 생각도 한번 해보고요. I think I, uh, uh, yes and no both. Um, <웃음> When I, um, 
when I make films, um, I spend a long time making them. Usually, you, you, the, the, the film I made in 72 hours was an exception. I usually spend several years. So there is a lot that goes into the work. I erase most of the text. Usually, I erase 90% of the text. And what's left on screen is only 10%. And yes, it has a particular diction. It usually comes from another century. And it can be hard to read that text. It is always my hope that with a book of poetry, or a really great novel, or a piece of intricate and carefully composed music, that there will be second, third, and fourth chances to engage with the work, and that as one sees the work again, it will begin to open up, and the experience will be different each time, because different things will be accessible. So I build them. Some films I know are best on the third screening. Some films I know are best on the fifth screening. Sometimes I know that I've made a film that you can get 90% out of it on the first screening, and the second screening will yield another 7%, and then lastly 3%. So I, different films exist f in my life for different reasons, and therefore are built differently. And I think that I will continue to make different kinds of films. I am currently at work on a very long film that lasts 33 hours, three hours the first night, and then seven and a half hours a day for four days. Very long film. There is some text in that, but not a lot of text. That's, that makes different demands on a viewer. That will have a lot of sound. And I'll tell you a secret now. If you come to see the extravagant shadows, you will hear sounds of nature as well as songs. So I do agree that it is a way of opening up the space in the room. Like your question earlier, it can become very, it can be very flat, but when sound comes in, all of a sudden the image has volume and the room breathes in a different way. And I have just started to explore that with the extravagant shadows. I'm very slow. It took me 20 years to use synchronous sound. I'll continue to do more. I'll get there. One day I might even use an actor. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe in 20 years. But I keep, uh, I keep exploring and I keep uh, encountering new problems. And my hope is always to solve the problem of the film. And I'm just approaching sound. So we'll see, we'll see where it goes. But I hope you will have, one of the things that I'm very, very happy about this exhibition is that there are multiple chances to see these programs. That makes me so happy. It is so rare in the United States that a work plays more than once or twice. And to have it play three or four times over the course of six weeks is like a dream. So I'm very, very grateful uh, for the chance that you might have to see the work multiple times. Because that's how, that's, it's, it's, in, it's intended uh, to unfold over multiple viewings. It's nice to meet you too. Thank you. 마치 제 원래 그 클로징 원래 질문이 사실 이제 그 지금 작업하고 계신 어인 프로그레스 프로젝트에 대한 질문이었는데 그 어, 거기서 이제 그 답을 또 하셨고 근데 그 이번에 상영하신 상영작인 가장 최근작인 디보션스 오픈 이머전트 오케이 저 갑자기 발생하는 사태에 대한 명상도 사실 이제 그 현재 진행 중인 프로젝트의 첫 번째 컬렉션으로 프로그램 노트에 언급이 돼 있는데 그 지금 그 프로젝트를 말씀하신 건지 이건 또 다른 프로젝트인지. 다른 프로젝트라면 어떤 프로젝트인지 예그예그 그, 거기에 대한 마지막으로 I always have multiple pots on the stove. I never know which one is going to boil first. I am wor I now have the series Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions where I am selecting roll cam single camera roll uncut camera rolls that I will show whenever I come across one that I feel doesn't need any editing. So there, there, I already have two more of those, so that will become a series. Uh, I'm working with a group of artists in Vienna uh, that are exploring uh, what they call retrograde technicity, specifically analog means of producing images and sounds in the digital age. 
uh, that's being co-sponsored by the Austrian Film Museum and the University of the Applied Arts in Vienna. And so it's a three-year project. We meet every six months in Vienna. Uh, and I've, I've been collecting uh, out-of-date and discontinued film stocks and film chemistry for 22 years. Uh, and I'm going to deal with what those stocks can still do by using them to photograph the forest around our cabin that burned extensively in a wildfire in 2010. So that's two projects. That film is very much uh, about the way in which trauma is encoded into landscape, the fire, and th it's called The Light, the Dead Sea, uh, the dead being the trees and the film stock. And it will be an experiment to see how those things react with one another. I also am making a 60-minute film uh, with 3,000 shots, 29 frames each. No, no other cut. Every, cu every 29 frames is a cut. Uh, about the reasons throughout history, uh, people have chosen to go to sea uh, for war, for exploration, for conquest, for economic reasons, for pleasure. Uh, I'm interested in the sea. Uh, and then the last, the large project, the 33-hour project, uh, has to do, I'm still, I'm still understanding it myself, uh, but I am attempting to do with images what I did in the extravagant shadows with words. That is, condense and irrigate to cross-cut between very long films that you might see in their entirety. I'm very interested in the French filmmaker Jacques Rivette and his film Out One, which is 12 hours and 40 minutes. Celine and Julie go boating, which is a little over three hours. I'm interested in how he made those films and the way they speak to each other, uh, the way they speak to the political situation in France after May of 1968, uh, and the way they speak to other instances of French cinema. So I consider that project to be a film a program, a performance, uh, a syllabus almost for a course. It's, uh, as, as Hollis Frampton might say, a pentagram for conjuring a narrative. I'm, work I'm interested in working in narrative space from art house cinema of the 60s and 70s, completely different than anything I have tried. Uh, so that will, be a, that will be a big experiment. But I don't know which of those will finish first because the film will call to me. Whichever project will call to me, I'll turn off the other burners and I'll let one pot boil. I hope to come back and share one or more of those with you. 예, 장시간 경청해 주시고 저 참여해 주셔 감사드리고 오늘 저기 좋은 말씀 주신 데이빗 게튼 감독님과 또 좋은 통역해 주신 이현정 선생님께 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 이제 마치겠습니다.